So we're now moving on to another, the next topic, which is the work segment. So I'd like to introduce that panel and also certainly Sharon. So Sharon Rolston is the interim director of the Cayman Islands government's new work department. She was seconded from the office of the ombudsman to develop the processes needed to realize the unity government's vision for a radical rethink how labor is managed in the Cayman Islands. Sharon, for those of you who know her, she's a lawyer. She's practiced for more than 20 years before joining government last year. While she is a new civil servant, quote unquote, she is not new to the civil service, having served on numerous statutory boards over the span of her legal career. Those appointments included the chairmanship of the Work Permit Board, the Maritime Authority Board, called Macy, the Board of Sinico, and the Public Service Appeals Commission, to name but a few. For her long service to the people of the Cayman Islands, Sharon was awarded the Queen's Certificate and Badge of Honor in 2010. Like so many outstanding speakers today, she's a former counselor of our Chamber of Commerce. She enjoys being active in her community, although she admits the bands of her job currently leave no time for other things. She loves like, the, lo things like coaching girls soft football, serving as a founding member of the YMCA, became an arts festival, and as a board member of CNCF. I can't believe she put this in, but you're, you're a busy lady and you can still find time to, wow. She is also currently enrolled in the first cohort of the Truman Baden Law School's Master's in Law degree program, which she'll complete in September. I think you should give her a round of applause just for that. <laughs> so Sharon is a true Georgetowner, having been born in the capital where she's always lived. She's a proud mom of Catherine, a university sophomore this year, and she always keeps, who always keeps her busy with uh, different activities, including numerous rescued pets. So Sharon will provide us with an update on the progress with establishing the new work structure, and following her presentation, she'll be joined by Dr. Stephen McAfee, McAfee, the president of UCCI, and Dan Scott, chairman of the Education Council. So please put your hands together and welcome Sharon to the podium. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Will. Don't let this fool you. I'm not going to be here long. I woke up with a sore throat today, so I'm going to struggle a little bit. Um, but Will also told me to try to keep it short because any speech after 10 minutes tends to put people to sleep. So I will try not to do that. I hope you all had some coffee on the break. <clears throat> Excuse me. Will asked me to share some uh, key points about what we are currently doing at work. So my presentation will be quite on a high level in order to cover the main points, but there is so much to talk about, and so I'm sure at the question se uh, session afterwards you can ask your questions then, and obviously later on at the, um, the less formal reception. After the general election in 2017, the Premier's unity government committed to changing Cayman's immigration system, which was not adequately serving Caymanian job seekers, nor employers who were in need of foreign labor. I think there was a little bit of an underestimation of just how bad the system was broken. And so after compiling data from internal and external stakeholders, I'm sure some of you participated in that effort, the results showed that the immigration system was, was way too broken to fix. So he tasked his ministry to radically change, his words, radically change the current processes that help Caymanians find jobs and help employers find the labor that they need to keep Cayman globally competitive. This was the birth of Workforce Opportunities and Residency Cayman, or what we now know as WORK. We're not really happy with that, I must say, but that's what we've got. It is important to recognize that WORK is not a merger of the two existing organizations, NWDA and Immigration as we know it. It is a brand new build out, which is ongoing now, even as what we know as NWDA and Immigration continue to trug along and function until the legislation changes and work is fully operational. 
We had made some headway into designing the new business processes and architecture that would support the new work organization when the unity government recognized the need to bolster the, its national security priorities. <clears throat> and with that, directed that it was necessary to remove the enforcement arm of immigration and merge it with, merge it with customs, creating what is now the Customs and Border Control, or CBC unit. It also at that time created a new Coast Guard agency. As all of these agencies fall under the same ministry, the build out of work had some delays as we rallied to split the immigration legislation, removing the enforcement and border control elements and placing those in the new CBC legislation. <clears throat> we, had also, we also had some unanticipated staff departures and other staff reshuffling to allow for the CBC merger, which obviously caused a, caused a lot of disruption on our end. But the iconic customs and immigration departments, as we knew them, were formally dissolved in February of this year with changes in their respective legislation. So we are now very much, as you can appreciate, in a state of transition, which is probably confusing to most, as we are still branded work, immigration, and NWDA. Importantly, though, what is happening behind the scenes is that we have continued the building and testing of technology that will make the difference between the way we currently operate and the way in which we will fill labor market gaps in the future. Work will be technology driven, powered by two systems that work as one seamless process for employers looking to find labor. On the one hand, one system will be the National Jobs Clearinghouse Portal, which I also want to simplify to something more simple like jobs portal, <clears throat> but for the time being that's what it is, where Caymanian seeking work or seeking better work will register. A key difference between the new system and the current system is that work will only register Caymanians who are job ready. It will act as a type of filter for those who need some other form of assistance before entering the job market, such as counseling or further training or even NAU assistance. The current system does not adequately filter job-ready Caymanians from those requiring other assistance, which we know has been a source of frustration to employers as well as job-ready Caymanians looking for work. The National Jobs Clearinghouse, which will roll out first, is designed to create two streams whereby Caymanians can register and search the portal directly for jobs or opt for a process which provides more guidance as well as soft skills training if needed before they enter the job market search. For employers, the National Job Clearinghouse will be the portal through which all vacant posts must be advertised. There will be no need to advertise in the newspapers as per the current law, but, but traditional advertising can be done in addition to the portal if desired. Only Caymanians registered on the portal will have sight of the job vacancies and likewise, only Caymanians registered on the site can be considered for employment. So for example, if you're advertising for a food and beverage server and no Caymanian food and beverage servers are listed on the portal, we are not going to require that you still go out and rummage through the bushes and find one. If you advertise elsewhere in addition to on the portal and a Caymanian responds to that alternative ad, you can of course hire them directly. There is no need to go through our system. We will shortly embark on a massive PR campaign to encourage job ready Caymanians to register on our portal and remove the stigma that has been attached to the NWDA as the agency for unemployables. None of that culture is transferring to work. This will be a brand new opportunity, but Caymanians for whom the system is designed to benefit will have to do their part and get registered or the system will never work for them. On the other side of the technology spectrum, the second system will support the process by which all permissions applications, so that's your work permits, Cayman status, and permanent residency applications are submitted. The way it will work in practice is that an employer will first search the jobs portal to determine if there are any job-ready Caymanians available for their advertised post. If there are, the process for them terminates, and that is obviously the result that we want. However, we must be realistic. So if no Caymanians are registered on the portal, or none that match the skill set that's required, the employer continues on with the process of applying for a work permit via the second phase of the system. 
The online application form will be greatly enhanced from what you're familiar with now. All supporting documentation required for an application will also be uploaded. Payments will be made online by way of a debit or credit card or by an escrow account so that our applications process is entirely, entirely paperless. <laughs> you must have seen our filing rooms. The system is designed not to accept any application that is incomplete. Therefore, once the application is transmitted to us, our team of administrators should be able to review and make a decision on an application in our benchmark time of two weeks. Now, of course, there's going to be some teething problems on our end and on your end initially, but that is the benchmark that we have set and the one that we think that we can actually um, exceed as well. We believe the short turnaround time will also greatly reduce the dependence on the temporary work permit process, which will create efficiencies and cost savings to our customers. The rules we are building into the system will also allow a more streamlined and secure outcome. For example, we will no longer be asking for police clearance certificates. Rather, the system will run a background check on the applicant and will only allow an application to proceed if the check comes back negative for infractions. This is what is actually taking place now every time you travel with the APIS or the Advanced Passenger Information Systems Check, which screens all airline passengers ahead of their arrival into most international airports, including ours. Our, our interface at work will be with agencies such as the Joint Regional Command Center, used by law enforcement in the USA, Canada, Caribbean, and Europe, along with Interpol and other international crime agencies, to thoroughly screen all work permit applicants from wherever they may originate. <clears throat> Our current system is woefully inadequate there. The system will also not ask you for any documents that a Cayman Islands government agency has issued. So for example, we will not be asking you to produce a trade and business license, a Cayman Islands issued passport or marriage certificate or birth certificate, et cetera. Our system will interface with other government agencies for that information. Our rules will also not ask you for documents we do not need. A classic example is the chest x-ray. <laughs> we can't read them, folks. <laughs> That's not our area of expertise. And so <laughs> we, what we're going to uh, be doing is instead of going through all of that medical questionnaire documentation, we are going to require you on your end to get information that we require, but get that before a doctor, and basically uh, a doctor will confirm that yes or no, the applicant is fit for work. So again, paperless. Um, we will set the parameters by what we consider to be, um, you know, the boxes that need to be ticked, but ultimately it would not be a document that you have to produce to us. The systems are being designed such that the applications process will be governed by the same set of rules for everyone, removing the subjectivity that can happen in decision making when the, within the current system. We will have peer-to-peer -peer reviews of applications for internal compliance purposes, and where two decisions are at odds, the application will be escalated up to a manager for a decision. All in all, the applications process will be much more secure, much more transparent, and provide much more consistency in decision making. Best of all, the turnaround time for applications will be greatly improved. There will be no waiting in line for hours on end. Applications can be made 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from the comfort of your home or your office or on the beach. For those who are less tech savvy, we will provide kiosks at our new, our new premises where our customer care officers will assist with the application scanning and upload, but whatever documents you bring in, you will also leave with. By way of an update as to where we are now, all of us in our respective roles, and I am wearing the hat of the Chief Immigration Officer, um, didn't sign up for those functions, but they're now mine as well. So we're all straddling the lines of keeping the lights on in the current regime, whilst undergoing training, developing the legislation for the new organization, developing and improving the rules for the new systems, and basically keeping up with the demands of building this innovative and important new department of the Cayman Islands government. It is not an easy task, 
especially when one considers that just since February until yesterday, so that's three and a half months roughly, our statistics show that our permission staff, again, that would be the work permits, uh, Cayman status and PR staff, processed 18,839 various permission requests. They did that with a staff of, well, they continue to do this. <laughs> this is just the way it is currently, <clears throat> with having only four full-time administrators, six board staff, plus supporting staff in filing and processing clerks but in any event, we are seriously, seriously strained um, with our human resources. We are, we're very understaffed. Likewise, uh, this is the case with an NWDA. Since January of this year, we helped 247 Caymanians get registered for jobs. We held 82 training sessions with 526 attendees. And we just completed our 26th cohort of the Passport to Success program, where some of our most vulnerable 12 graduates in all this time, turned their lives around and are now job ready. So I, I was at that graduation ceremony and I was really moved because some of these children come from hopeless, hopeless backgrounds. And they went into the program rough and ready. They gave their instructors a really hard time, <clears throat> I'm told. But to hear them speak on their graduation day, it was, it was nothing short of amazing. And those kinds of success stories need to be shared more often because I'm here to tell you that our Caymanian kids just need, just need an opportunity. They just really need an opportunity. Again, all of, those, um, all of those assistances were done with only two people in each of our respective training and registering Caymanian staff. We had a total of four people processing or making all of that happen. So, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing, and I know that we frustrate you, and, and yeah, if, but if you could only see what's going on behind the scenes, you might say, I get it, I, I totally understand. And I should say, we're doing all of this between four different um, locations, and it's a very manual, very labor-intensive process, because everything we do is with a file, a physical file, and it is... They have to be transported from one area, to, from one building to the next building. So it's anything but, but efficient. So we're doing all of that. And meanwhile, our staff are going through a competitive recruitment exercise for the new jobs that are being created at work, followed by training, which means that they operate in a current state. They operate in current state processes, but where titles and receive training reflective of the new processes that are being developed. Essentially, they're constantly wearing two hats. So I take my, my hat off to them. Some of my staff surprised me by showing up here, and I must say they're, two, they're a couple of my superstars who make your lives easier because they are so e efficient. And I'm not going to point them out because you all might give them more work. <laughs> but thank you, ladies, for being here. I'm, I'm really touched by the, by the fact that you came to surprise me. And you did. <clears throat> so now I'm like Trump, I went off script. Let me get back to where I was. Um, okay, so the, the next update relax, relates to our facilities. And having said that we're operating out of four different um, locations, uh, it's so thrilling for us to finally have a place. Um, and so after a very, very long process, demolition and construction of our fit-out will commence this Friday. Uh, we'll all be under one roof. We'll be on two floors, but we'll all be in one building finally at the end of that. So I'm, I it can't come fast enough. We've just partnered with Phoenix for that, um, for that fit out, and we're confident that they will work diligently to meet our aggressive timelines for completion. Um, further along in the facilities, we were donated furniture by one of the leading law firms, Conyers de Limpierman, so a little shout out for them. Um, they donated 10 suites of office furniture when they moved premises, so those will help people like me have an office um, and our, some of our higher level staff. So thank you publicly to Conyers Dillon Pierman. Um, the rest of our furniture has been ordered, the, the delivery of which will dovetail with the completion of the office fit out, as well as when our systems are ready to go live. On Monday of this week, so that's two days ago, we tested for the National Jobs Clearinghouse Phase 1 certification, and I'm really happy to report that the testing went well, so that means we can now move to the next uh, phase of testing. On the recruitment side, we have completed a good portion of our internal 
recruitment, but we still have some higher level vacancies which are currently being advertised. We continue to promote and transition current staff into new roles and are in the process of confirming a training manager who we lost to CBC, who will begin the onboarding training and the continuous training of our staff to make the transition from the current culture into the new customer-centric culture of work. Training is very important to us and we've made that commitment to our staff and they do have to go through a mandatory period of training every single year um, to, to better themselves, to upskill themselves. The one very component, important component over which we have no control is the legislation that will give work its operational powers. As you can imagine, our new business processes eliminate much of what is now provided for in law. And so we are busy prioritizing drafts for the next legislative sitting, which we are told will be sometime in September. As soon as we have the draft legislation in a form for public consultation, obviously, we will make it available to you and invite your feedback. And we've taken that stance throughout the process of having our stakeholders internal, our staff, as well as our external customers help build this organization with us. And so we look forward to your continued partnership as we move to the next phase. We will be shortly testing the National Jobs Clearinghouse portal uh, with some 20 private sector partners, some of you are here today, who have volunteered to test the system with us. Be on the lookout for a notice. Um, I was hoping to have a date for you, but, but our dates for that testing will be rolling out shortly, so be looking for an email from me soon. I appreciate that this has been a very long time coming, no more so for you than for most of us working in the current system day to day. Building a whole new department essentially from scratch, changing the culture that has plagued the current state for so long has been monumental and it continues to be. We are still very much a work in progress. I am, however, very optimistic that we're almost out of the tunnel and so we only have to beg your indulgence with us for a little bit longer. That means until the fall because that is when the, hopefully the legislation um, will, will get passed but obviously by then our fit out, our systems, our recruitment, all of the things, furniture, all of the other things um, should be ready within that time frame as well. In conclusion, I was asked about the type of challenges that we might expect with the new technology, which would impact the effectiveness of the system meeting labor needs and demands. After working in this kind of um, the current regime, the system is so good. It's so good. It was hard to find anything bad about it, but um, we have to be realistic too and, and understand that, that it will, you know, it, it will make a huge improvement. Um, but since I have to comment on what I see as uh, might negatively impact, um, I don't think they're that bad. But obviously the first one is the adoption of the new processes and online system by our customers because most people don't like change. They don't respond very well to change. And so we, getting everybody across to this new entirely paperless technology driven system um, will have its teething issues, we, we appreciate that. Also, not everyone is gonna be tech savvy, and so that's why we will have um, kiosk and staff readily available all the time to help people who, who have difficulty using our system. Another um, frustration that we might find, or we know we're gonna have, is trying to get our job seekers and employers on the new system. It is going to be a monumental task. I only learned on Monday that we have to register everyone pretty much like how you do the voters registration on a face-to-face -face kind of basis in order that everyone can be, and I should say this, the reason we're having to do that is because we were hoping that the government's new national ID um, number that will be issued to every single person that arrives in Cayman would have been up and running, but it's not. And so we're not going to wait on that and be further delayed. We're going to, create our own ID so that every person applying for a work permit, every work permit applicant, every Caymanian job seeker, every single person that we interface with will have an ID number. Um, so uh, that is something that we have to do. It's going to be huge, but we will encourage you, you know, in your own respective offices, please make your staff aware of the importance of getting registered 
um, and we will be making an announcement, an announcement about that. I'm looking at Alex. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to have to update you on it, but it won't be that long coming because September is not that far off. Last thing is going to be patience for you and for us as the new system with the new processes um, are going to be new. It's going to be a very steep learning curve, but we think that you will be pleasantly surprised with the process. Patients will also be required for the new section, our labor market assessment unit that will collect and analyze the data to identify trends in the labor market and demand and the demands of the private sector. Once we have usable data, we will be able to strategically manage, monitor, and analyze labor needs and trends, but it will take quite some time. We estimate two years, roughly, for us to be able to uh, accumulate and gather that data, which will help to inform where the job gaps are most critical. We deliberately did not um, roll that out in initially because when we had our other delays, we thought it's best just to get the services that our customers are familiar with, and we can stall that one, but now we're ramping that up again to, to start the advertising to fill the post within that section of our department. Lastly, work is a customer, sorry, work is based on a customer-centric approach. This was driven by our employees when we polled them, and we said, what do you want work to look like? What is most important to you? And the overwhelming response amongst our employees was that they wanted, to be, wanted it to be a center of excellence for customer service. So our task is to foster a new culture of change and continuous improvement in pursuit of that goal, customer service excellent. We have said it, and we want you to hold us to it. Thank you for the opportunity of being able to provide you with this update, and I trust you found it helpful. Thank you very much, Sharon. I would ask uh, Dr. McAfee and Dan Scott to join Sharon on the, on the platform. I believe they've agreed that they're going to have some, basically some opening remarks before we then turn it over to a panel discussion. So I guess we'll start with ladies first. We'll start with Dr. McAfee. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today and to join this interesting and informative discussion. I want to begin by saying I'm thrilled to see UCCI students, faculty and staff here taking advantage of every learning opportunity afforded them. So I want to start with the concept of workforce development. I could speak to you for hours about the work that we do of human potential, but to keep my remarks brief, I want to focus on workforce development this afternoon. I'll begin by saying that the workforce system in the Cayman Islands has not kept pace with the economic expansion thus far, and it must be re-engineered to meet our forecasted growth. We have an opportunity today to consider how best to change future workforce and civic outcomes. It's been my experience over years that when educators and employers work together, programs of study can enhance both work readiness and career advancement. Education that coordinates classroom instruction with work-based learning experiences and leads to the attainment of industry-endorsed education credentials and desired job skills is what you will hear me refer to today as career pathways. Multiple entry and exit points along a career pathway enable people to upskill and secure jobs with increasing responsibility and compensation. Career pathways explicitly map the education and soft skills and workforce skills needed to enter into a profession and to continue to progress through various varying stages of uh, increasing ability. As we know, one excellent choice is a college degree, but other post-secondary credentials are equally important and can be pathways to exciting careers. Middle skill jobs require 
education beyond high school up to a four-year degree, and they make up a large portion of the labor market in the Cayman Islands. Technical vocational education and training and many associate degree programs can provide entry into rewarding middle skill jobs with career advancement. We must focus on high leverage strategies that scaffold from existing efforts to build a comprehensive national demand driven careers pathway system. This type of system could prepare thousands of people for middle skill jobs in targeted high growth industry and social sectors. So I want to talk to you about this concept of building a comprehensive demand driven career pathway system because it's a collective responsibility. Employers, we need you to collaborate with educational institutions like UCCI to develop sector-based approaches to expanding the talent supply that possess the skills and the education that you need. To accomplish this, we need you to contribute to the development of a national framework, providing guidance on the need of both degree programs and fast-track industry-valued credentials that are customized to meet the needs of a diverse range of job seekers. As educators, we must design curricula and develop new programs of study that increasingly offer a sequence of short-term credentials that can be stacked into longer career pathways, which give job seekers a clearer understanding of educational on and off ramps to advance their careers as circumstances permit. If we begin now, this type of approach would allow our nation to better meet the needs of youth and adults who require academic instruction in addition to professional training that leads to workforce readiness. We will accomplish this through cooperative work-based learning where classroom education and work site internships are interwoven with co into cohesive learning experiences. Community-based organizations, we need you to provide critical support to ensure our students are thriving and completing their educational goals. So to build this demand-driven workforce development system, we will have to have both private and public funding. The most successful systems that I've seen across the world target program investments through regional funding collaboratives to ensure mutual benefit for employers and job seekers. Targeting gaps in the current education system and catalyzing involvement of key stakeholders. One approach is to incentivize braided funding strategies to leverage public and private funding to incubate new strategies. Government, I ask that you consider how to scale impact by aligning existing education and workforce development initiatives and funding where possible with the goal of more effectively closing the skills gap within this national framework. Finally, we need new structures and collaborations. Let's establish sector councils, industry-based collaborations of employers and educators. Let's strengthen the capacity of educational institution to gather, analyze, and predict real-time labor market needs and outcomes. Finally, let's broaden access to tertiary education by developing targeted outreach strategies to grow post-secondary attendance, workforce readiness, to a broader group of people. In closing, the Cayman Islands has the knowledge and the resources to make comprehensive tertiary education a reality. UCCI is raising our hand and asking you to join us as we undertake this important national priority of building a demand-driven tertiary education system. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm actually pleased to be here and thank you to the Chamber for what I think is a very timely and important forum that you've, you've said about this afternoon. Cayman's economy is thriving. All indications are that we will, over the next few years, experience our fastest rate of growth ever. 
Our continued success will depend on how we respond. A critical part of that response is human capital. We need to continue to attract top talent from all over the world. At the same time, it is critically important that we provide the full spectrum of our Caymanian talent pool with the very best education to ensure that they too can fully participate in the Cayman economic miracle. Under the leadership of the minister, the Honorable Juliana O'Connor Connolly, the Education Council and the Ministry of Education are undertaking various initiatives to ensure that we serve the students of our country and deliver for them the very best. This in turn will ensure that businesses can access top quality, well-educated talent who together can grow and prosper. One of the in initiatives which you may be aware of is the introduction of the current national curriculum of England. Effective August this year, government primary schools will adopt this curriculum and high schools will do so beginning August 2020. Recognizing that students learn in a variety of different ways, it is important to have a curriculum and support resources to allow all students to succeed. I am therefore pleased to report that government will be providing the necessary support material such as textbooks, workbooks, exercise book, online resources, as well as hands-on materials. Rest assured that much hard work is being undertaken by the ministry and others in the government education system to make the changes needed to ensure that the Cayman Islands government schools can deliver students that can compete with their counterparts globally. The other thing I would comment on at this stage is that we have had outstanding support across the entire elected group of folks that we've worked with, um, both on the government side as well as on the other. And in addition to that, the deputy governor and his team have been absolutely outstanding. Earlier this year, I had the privilege of joining the minister, the counselor, and a team from the Ministry of Education to visit some schools in England whose student bodies come from very disadvantaged backgrounds. In spite of their backgrounds and the large class sizes in some of these schools, these students were scoring well above the national average. There are a number of factors which contribute to the success of these schools. Nevertheless, the thing that struck me most was that each of these schools had teachers and school leaders who believed that every child could achieve regardless of where they came from or their special educational needs. My ask of you today is that you join us in our belief that every child in school in the Cayman Islands can achieve regardless of their background and share our commitment to ensure that they are given every opportunity to do so. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Obviously, the topic is a bit wide ranging between uh, workforce development and also the, the new work structure. So the questions range from on both, both sides, but obviously, as Sharon, as you know, you're you're overworked, but uh, there are a lot of questions to you again. <laughs> but let's start with the first one, is uh, will they be doing, will your department be doing away with the business staffing plans? If I can have my way, yes. Um, I can say that we have designed our systems to not involve the boards at all, because when we were doing our review of current systems, that is the one area where uh, there's a backlog, and, and we know we've had famous backlogs with PR and work permits. Um, so we're designing our system to be entirely um, 
based on our an administrative kind of review. Now we don't have the final say on that, so if you um, you might need to lobby your respective government <laughs> officials on that, but for our part, we're designing the system to be entirely um, administrative based and no boards. Um, they, they, they can't feature uh, because we're, we're focused on efficiencies and uh, having boards is unfortunately, in my view, a thing of the past. So the next question just deals with your structure of your department and they just ask a simple question. With the economy doing so well, why are you understaffed? That's partly to do with the split that um, we were not anticipating when, when we had to take, when we split some of our function at, and that went over to CBC. Now that included some of our uh, staff who are not even in the enforcement or border control areas. But what we said to our staff is that in this transition and in, in creating these new agencies, we don't want anyone to not have an opportunity to, to move or to develop themselves and get in a different area. And so that obviously created some of the, um, some of the staffing situation that, that we have now because we had to rally and plug holes we are, um, the other thing, the other reason, um, because the system is new and we are anticipating our needs, we don't know what they all will be. And so it's really difficult to go and hire a bunch of staff that you don't know if they're going to be, you know, necessary once the system gets um, up and running. Because, like I said, most of what we do now is so manual. Um, it's labor intensive and the new system will not be that way. And we don't want to hire people and then have to let them go. So I'm sorry, but that's, that's just one of our frustrations right now. It's really difficult for our staff. So I can only ask you to, to just bear with us because there, there are a number of reasons why we're in this situation. Another question deals with uh, regards to the future of work permits, but also to the rollover in PR. And what the question is, will that system move over to the same type of system as you're uh, planning for work permits? for PR and permanent re and uh, companion status. If, if I'm understanding the question correctly, all permissions applications will go through our system. Okay, it's, including those. Yes. So one of the questions deals with the training and upskilling of Caymanians. Um, so he's basically said, we have heard nothing on training or upskilling of Caymanians. Is this because there is no intentions to address the problem or is the responsibility going to be moved to some other department? No, we very much want to own that, but um, what, we, what we don't want to do is be the trainers, though. Um, we will provide the, the facility where Caymanians can come and register with us, and we, we, uh, provide, uh, we locate areas where they can get the training that they need. If they need further education, we will refer them to people like Dr. Stacy. Um, but we will be very much counting on, the, on all employers to take their responsibility seriously. Uh, section, sorry, Regulation 6.2 puts the onus on employers to train. And without a recognized and workable training um, regime within an organization, we have grounds to deny a work permit. And we have a very apt up compliance section that we're building. We're not gonna be in the bushes chasing overstayers. We're going to be making sure that people are complying with our laws. So this question kind of relates the same way. It's basically saying when you identify somebody as an unemployed, came, an employable Caymanians, and they're filtered out of the system or the job portal, what happens to them? And I guess it says, has provision been made to provide training and education? So these well, are the people that you've identified that are not work ready. Well, we do have uh, people who are trained to identify, you know, where an individual is not job ready and they will analyze and work with other government agencies to get the assistance that that individual will need. Um, the current way we work is that everybody gets dumped into the NWDA stream and we just don't have the resources to screen everyone so they all get out, you, you know, you ended up with them um, and they're not necessarily job ready. Our commitment is to make sure that we vet them, we screen them and we give them the assistance that they need before they go on our job ready portal. And, and we take that seriously because people do have needs. I mean, there are certain people that have, um, you know, let me use it as an example, mental health issues. We're not just going to throw them out the door and say, we can't help you. We're going to get them, put them with the agency that can give them the help that they need. So the next one is probably directed to uh, Dr. McAfee. It says, if our focus is on getting Caymanians employed, 
why don't we invest more in local tertiary education by improving their campus and expanding their curriculum? I think as any good investor, you need to understand what the plan looks like and what that investment will lead to. I, we are having great conversations right now, part of the opportunity to be with you here today. And since I've been here, um, since the end of December, have been trying to spend time in the community to understand. Our mission as the public access institution is to broadly serve both workforce development, economic development, innovation, social change. We have a broad remit. And by the very nature of that remit, we have, uh, there are a lot of resources that are brought to bear to deliver on that well. Our goal is to do well whatever is put in front of us so that we build your trust in the community. So, but I do think that if you look at how uh, higher education is funded and financed across the world, it is a public-private partnership. We are going to have to bring more resources to bear for tertiary education. My goal is to ensure that whatever we do here, that we're equally advantaging uh, our companions and residents to compete globally. So, so there's work to be done. There are resources that will be required to do that. I think what we need to do is make sure that we're using current resources to the best of our ability and then assess what other investments are needed uh, to make sure we're moving forward. As the Cayman Islands continues to grow in terms of its population, it's already seeing stress on the physical education structures in terms of the schools. Um, I think obviously Cayman International School is almost doubling the size of their school. The question for the panel, maybe Mr. Scott or both of you is, are we investing enough in, the cap, in, in terms of building more spaces, particularly if, as we try to, or as we increase our population towards this magical 100,000? I think the reality is, is, as you look at today, there's no question that the, there's tremendous demand, and I think in very short order, as we look at our growth, the demand will exceed supply. Um, I said to someone just yesterday that if I wasn't sitting as a member of Ed Council, I would probably invest in a school because it's a surefire way, because the demand absolutely is there. Um, going back to Dr. Stace's point on the question of how do we do that? Do we simply leave government to do it? I'm pleased, for example, to see CIS in their expansion. Um, you heard earlier from Minister McTaggart that government is also talking about their new high school. But I do think there is the opportunity, and we get back to this when we think about education, for continued expansion, continued private sector involvement, even as, as government seeks to expand what they're doing. So the answer, I think, in a roundabout way is yes, there's going to be, there is demand and there will be huge demand in my view. In other countries, um, according to this person who gave me this question, uh, particularly in the UK, when they have unemployment issues, they actually target specific areas and actually launch programs to ensure that the people have, where the high unemployment rates are, there are specific programs to ensure that those people receive the attention they need. Do you think that uh, higher uh, concentration needs to be done on where the unemployment really is in the country and focus specific programs in those districts? Absolutely. Uh, I think it, what you often see in systems like the UK is base funding and then incentive funding that's uh, brought to bear to target specific issues that happen to be most important at any given time. But it goes to the point I made earlier about we need to have real-time accurate data so that we do understand how the resources that we're bringing to bear are affecting change. And, uh, and so I, I think that is something that we want to push forward on. We, at a higher education level, need investments not only in brick and mortar to bring our campus up to contemporary learning environment, but we also need to build uh, our digital capabilities, our 
technology enabled learning. We want access to exist for people regardless of where they live and work. You shouldn't have to come to the UCCI campus to get the education and training you need. We want you to, if that's what works for you and you want to do that, but we need to be able to deliver education in a more real time, uh, not space constrained way. And the, the final question for this panel is, the enrollment of the private schools has increased while the government grant has not increased. And I'm not sure whether you are in the position to answer this directly, but should the government consider increasing this? Well, I, I guess the question is, is, and I'm not sure what, what the question is directed at. My view on it is that government currently is spending a great deal of money to try and meet its own needs. Um, at some point in time, I, I certainly would be open to the idea that if private schools are building the infrastructure, that perhaps, and again, this is just my view, not necessarily the view of the government of the day or others, or even the council, that there may be the opportunity for government to say to them, for example, okay, you're gonna build a school, you build the bricks and mortar, we will guarantee you 300 students, an agreed rate, and equally as well, the private school doesn't get to cherry pick those students, but at the same time, it provides the opportunity for them to get that, that's a guaranteed start, plus students that are non k manuals would also go to the same school. And it gets us back to this whole idea of a more integrated school. So I, I think from my standpoint, it would be tremendous to do it in that very targeted way. Currently, when there's a grant from government to the private schools, it does not necessarily target Caymanians or, or those needs, right? So that the challenge is do you keep doing that while at the same time trying to add more schools and build high schools and build more government schools? My view is a better approach is say, we will provide you with the students and we will pay for them to go to school and you build the bricks and mortar and you bring the other students. So together we get back to an integrated school system. It's just a final point on that. Do we are currently operate a segregated school, school system where the public schools primarily are Caymanian students and w the rest of the expatriate students are just uh, basically sent to the private system? Uh, tell us what yeah. your view. Well, I, I think using the term segregated is, is a harsh term and probably inappropriate. And I'll tell you why. It is all based on the ability as to what to deliver. So currently the challenge the government school has is that it is overwhelmed by the number of Caymanian children already in there and they simply don't have the space available. When I went to school in the public school, we absolutely did have everybody together. And it's for that reason that I think as you look back and the whole concept of back to the future, but it is also based on what is available and how do we spend it. So. The primary focus of the government has to be to ensure that every single Caymanian is given the opportunity to get an education to go to school. That has to be their primary focus. Now, the idea that, and I think everybody I've, I've, I've spoken to, certainly the minister, the current government, the, the elected members would all say there's real value in having an integrated system. But the question is, is how do we best do that? And I would submit the way that we do it is create these public-private partnerships and we do it that way as opposed to simply saying government must build a school to accommodate everybody. Because if we follow the trend, which is you talk about growing to 100,000 students, 100,000 people, which we'll be talking about I think in the next session, the question is, is how many new students will we be adding and how much with government, albeit it's challenged to plan for the number of increase for Caymanian, what sort of budget do they need to be thinking about to be able to accommodate the children of those additional 30 odd thousand folks who are coming, right? We could probably spend another hour just on this subject, but put your hands together and thank Sharon, <laughs> Dr. McAfee, and Dan Scott. Thank you so much.